Hi everybody, welcome back. So in this video we will learn two ways of calculating the Gibbs free energy of a reaction in order to tell us if the reaction is spontaneous or not. So one formula we have previously learned is that delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. And we like to work with Gibbs free energy because it focuses entirely on the system and in this case the reaction. That's what we're concerned about as chemists is the reaction. And once we know the sign of Gibbs free energy, whether it's positive or negative, we can determine if the reaction is spontaneous or not. And so in this case here, the way I've written this equation, we're in standard conditions, which typically means the temperature is 298 Kelvin or 25 degrees Celsius. But since the changes in the enthalpy of reaction and the entropy of the reaction over a limited temperature range are small compared to changes in temperature itself. We can use this equation for other temperatures too. Okay, so basically, since temperature is within the equation itself, it is okay to plug in other temperatures besides 298 Kelvin um, because the changes in enthalpy and entropy over a large temperature range actually are very small themselves um, so they don't fluctuate too much so it's okay to do that and still look up literature data that's at standard conditions and that kind of gives you an idea of like okay if i run this reaction at a high temperature will the gibbs free energy positive or negative and then vice versa if i ran it at low temperatures so just so you know that it's okay to use this equation for temperatures other than 298 Kelvin, even though you'll be plugging in data that is at standard conditions. So let's do an example together. Now I'm just doing one equation here, one reaction here, and we wanna calculate the enthalpy of the reaction, the entropy of the reaction, and then we can calculate the Gibbs free energy of the reaction at 25 degrees Celsius, and that will allow us to determine if the reaction is spontaneous or non-spontaneous. And then if it's a non-spontaneous reaction, you know, we're changing the temperature. So in a previous video, we discussed that some conditions um, could make it that the reaction becomes spontaneous at high temperatures, or maybe it becomes spontaneous at low temperatures. We'll have to look at that. Um, and then, yeah, so let's go ahead and get started. So whenever you have to work these types of problems for your homework, um, you'll need to look up this literature data in your textbook. So for example, the enthalpy, you would look up the enthalpy of formation for each reactant and product. And that's usually in kilojoules per mole of those species. And like I've, I've said in the previous video, I like to kind of make it a table right underneath the reaction itself. So for methane, it's negative 74.6. For ethane, it's negative 84.68. And for hydrogen gas, it is zero kilojoules per mole. Now, I just want to point out here that this number may not be provided. 
because it's assumed that the enthalpy of formation for elements in their natural state is zero. So if you're working a word problem in an assessment, I would provide all the literature data that you need it within the context of the problem. But if you're trying to calculate the enthalpy of reaction and then you realize, wait a second, um, I don't have the enthalpy of formation for hydrogen gas, then hopefully that's a big clue to you that, oh, wait a second, it's in its most natural form, hydrogen doesn't exist like as a monatomic element, it wants to be diatomic, so it exists as H2 gas in nature, and so therefore its enthalpy of formation must be zero. So if it's not provided within the problem, take a step back and think about, oh wait, is this actually just zero because it's a pure element in its natural form, okay? All right, another data that you would have to look up or would be provided for you are the molar entropies. And those are usually in joules per Kelvin mole. And it's like talking about per mole of that species itself. Once again, I've said before that sometimes moles is dropped, so it's like joules per Kelvin and just understood that it's per mole. All right, for meth methane, it's 186. For ethane, it's 229.2. And for hydrogen gas is 130.7. So for entropy, it's not going to ever be zero with the molecules we're working with and at the temperatures we're working at. You would need a perfect crystal at absolute zero Kelvin in order to have theoretically zero entropy. Okay. So now we can go ahead and calculate the entropy and enthalpy of the reactions. I'll do enthalpy first. So state functions products minus reactants must take into account the balanced chemical equation so do the ethane there's one mole of ethane here so i'm taking into account stoichiometric coefficients so there's that one times its enthalpy of formation plus and i'm going to include the hydrogen even though it's going to end up being zero but just so you can see that everything would be included, all the products, and then minus the reactants. So there's two moles of methane times negative 74.6. Now the units are in kilojoules per mole, so therefore we would get 64.5 kilojoules. And you can write kilojoules per mole of the reaction if you like, but I'll just keep it at 64.5 kilojoules here. All right, let's do the same thing for the entropy of the reaction. Products minus reactants. So we have the ethane plus hydrogen gas, taking into account the stoichiometric coefficients, even though they're one, write it down so you never ever forget. It's good practice. And then methane has a stoichiometric coefficient of two, so we gotta take that into account. And when you plug this into your calculator, the units are in joules per Kelvin mole, um, so I'm gonna write it as negative 12.1 joules per Kelvin. Once again, you can keep mole or just assume per mole of reaction. Now, we wanna calculate Gibbs free energy, and usually Gibbs free energy is in kilojoules. And so a lot of times you will need to convert this into kilojoules. So divide it by a thousand and you would get negative point zero two one two one kilojoules per Kelvin. Now the most common mistake I see with these types of calculations is that students forget to do that conversion. And so they plug in kilojoules and they plug in joules into the equation and then their Gibbs free energy value is incorrect. So always, always write down your units. Um, don't get um, too relaxed about doing that. Sometimes students are just like working too fast, too quick. Um, and then that's when those kinds of mistakes would occur. So I don't want that to happen for you. All right, so let's go ahead and plug and chug into our Gibbs free energy equation here for the reaction. It is equal to delta H, 64.5 kilojoules minus 298 Kelvin, so we're still working at 25 degrees Celsius, times negative 
kilojoules per Kelvin. It's minus T delta S. And this is a positive 68.1 kilojoules per mole of that reaction. All right. So with a positive delta G, is this reaction spontaneous or non-spontaneous? Excellent. This is non-spontaneous. Um, if you had a negative delta G, then that indicates a spontaneous reaction. And the question is also asking us, well, what happens if we change temperature? Right? Well, if we look at enthalpy, the enthalpy itself is positive. That's not very favorable. Usually a favorable enthalpy is exothermic, correct? And the entropy is negative. And in a previous video, we had discussed predicting whether or not temperature would help us out. Um, so if we have a positive here and then minus a negative here, which is just essentially a negative times a negative would make this positive, then it means that delta G would always be positive. So it doesn't matter like, you know, the temperature here, if it's small or big, because delta G, no matter what the temperature is, will always be a positive value. And so we can conclude that since both enthalpy and entropy are not favorable, The reaction is non-spontaneous at any temperature. Well, since Gibbs free energy, as you've heard me state already, is a state function, there's another way you could calculate the Gibbs free energy of a reaction, and that's products minus reactants. If you can find the Gibbs free energy of formation for each reactant and product, you need to take into account the moles. So you need to have the balanced chemical equation available. So anytime you see little F, by the way, it's formation from its cons um, constituent elements, basically what it's composed of, something that, once again, you could find this in the back of your textbook in the appendix. Be mindful of the states of matter that you're working with, um, making sure that if you had to look up water, that is it a liquid or a gas, because you'll have two different numbers um, for that, depending on the state of matter. All right. So just to make note that Gibbs free energy of elements in their standard states, like in their most pure elemental form that occur in nature, right? So that includes the diatomics. So these are zero, just like enthalpy. So let's go ahead and use the same equation we just worked out using delta G um, is equal to delta H minus delta S. It's equal to delta H minus T delta S. Um, and use the different formula here that we've just learned of products minus reactants and see if we get the same answer. All right, so the equation or the reaction that we were working with is methane reacting to form ethane plus hydrogen gas. You would need to look up the Gibbs free energy of formation for each species, and it's usually in kilojoules per mole. So this is negative 50.5, negative 32. And you may not be provided this number, but it's assumed that since hydrogen in its most natural form in nature, that would be equal to what? Zero. So once again, that might not be provided for you, so be mindful of that. 
So delta G of the reaction is equal to products minus reactants, taking into account the stoichiometric coefficient. It's one and one for um, ethane and hydrogen gas. Minus two times negative 50.5. So products minus reactants, and you would get a plus 69 kilojoules per mole of reaction, still non-spontaneous. And yes, we essentially got the same answer as we did when we use this equation of delta H minus T delta S, right? So you may be looking at it and say, wow, it's a lot more work <laughs> to do delta H minus T delta S versus just doing products minus reactants. Like why wouldn't you just use this equation the entire time? Well, what you'll notice here with this particular equation is that temperature is not a part of it. And as a chemist, we like to change the temperature that we run our reactions in to see how it'll change the outcome. Let's see if it optimizes it, right? And so therefore, it is more useful to use this equation here where we can plug in different temperatures than it would be to use this equation. Um, so the method that we worked out in question five on the previous page can be used to determine the Gibbs free energy of a reaction with temperature changes. So that's the advantage of using delta H minus T delta S. And on an assessment, it'll be quite obvious which equation you'll have to use because you'll be provided data within the context of the problem. So maybe you would be provided just the Gibbs, ener um, Gibbs free energy of the reactants and products, um, and or you would be given the enthalpy and the entropy. So it'll kind of guide you in a sense, just seeing what data is provided um, so that you can calculate the Gibbs free energy of the reaction, determine if it's spontaneous or non-spontaneous, and perhaps can it be made spontaneous if it's not um, by changing temperatures. So that's something that you'll practice with your homework. Um, and so continue to practice both methods so you feel comfortable with utilizing them to solve for the Gibbs free energy of a reaction. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time.